Well, hello, David. How you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, man? Doing really good. I'm glad to have you back on the show. It's been, oh my goodness, October 2021, I think is when I had you on last time. So uh, it's really good to have you back. I think it was it 2021 or was it even oh. before that? I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'd have to look. It may have been before that, before COVID maybe. Let's see if my memory serves me correctly. I was still in my apartment after I moved back to the state. So that would have been 2019. Okay. Um, then of course I, I had my daughter in 2020. <laughs> um, and then, wow, a lot, a lot has changed since we last talked. Yeah, I no, I I thought it was 2021, but uh, now that you think about it, I don't remember you having a daughter when we talked last time. So, yeah, it's been hey, a little time, bit longer than I thought. Time flies, man. It yeah, always it, does. It does. What well, catch us up on where what you've been doing? Um, for those that don't know you, maybe uh, a little bit about how you got into photography in the first place. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to start off with that. Um, We've talked before, so you kind of know my story, but anybody who doesn't know, um, I've been a landscape photographer since full time about uh, 2015, 2016, but worked on it on the side since 2010. Um, and I always kind of had this inkling, I guess, since I got a digital camera, but I, I really started in my photography journey in high school, uh, you see, I found this, I wasn't the best student, I'll put it that way. And I was always looking for these little loopholes I could get out of classes with and things like that. So I found a loophole in our um, direct syllabus of like how you could graduate, get to college, all that stuff. Um, and I could skip out on a geography class if I chose an extra elective. And I found this loophole and I chose film photography as my elective. And lo and behold, so many years later, it's it's what I do uh, with my life. So it's kind of funny how things work out sometimes. But ever since getting a, a digital camera, you know, it's it's really been one of those things where I don't know if you're like me, Jason, but I when I latch on to something like photography or another hobby, um, I love, you know, skateboarding's really cool. Uh, I play a lot of disc golf now. And and when I latch on to something like that, I, I just want to learn everything about it. And I just <laughs> spend all this time just consuming information and trying to, to become as much of an expert knowledge as I can on that topic. And photography is just something that kept growing, kept growing. It's funny with hobbies for me, like I'll latch onto something and it grows and then it kind of fizzles out and I'll latch onto the next thing and, and move on. But photography's never fizzled out for me. It's always interesting. And I think it's because you can never really master photography. You can, you can get close and you can really master what you're trying to do with it. Uh, but there's always something to learn and there's always something to improve on and tweak with photography, especially with all the technology we have now with cameras, editing, different things like that. So photography has always been a really big passion of mine um, since I discovered it and really got into it. Um, since the last time we talked, you know, I mentioned we had moved back to the States. I was a missionary in Haiti with my wife for a couple of years. Then we moved back to the States. Um, since then, uh, we, we had a daughter, um, she's two and a half now, which she'll remind you of about every five minutes, which is great. <laughs> and, um, she, she's just this amazing, like little thing to watch, uh, grow and interact with and, and learn about. And I think since then photography, you know, it was just this like, thing that consumed my life but now I have this like different outlook on photography where it's this outlet uh, for me not only my business but also the ability just to get outside and enjoy the peace and quiet because I used to be this run and gun photographer like trying to get everything in one trip or something like that and now I'm much more slow processed um, watching things as they evolve and and different things like that. So not only has like major events in my life changed since the last time we talked, but also my outlook on photography too. 
Uh, that's that's wonderful to hear, actually. And I share a lot of those same commonalities. Whenever I do a new hobby, I jump all in, all yeah. in, I, you know, <laughs> hours and hours watching YouTube, reading books, doing everything I can to consume every bit of information about that new topic. With photography, it's much the same. I have certain hobbies that come and go, but photography always stays around. Maybe it's not as active as it could be sometimes when I'm doing those other hobbies, but it is always there and there's always something to learn. I heard uh, recently, I heard an interview where somebody said, oh, well, I don't really learn anything new in photography anymore. Uh, I've, I pretty much know all the F-stops. I was like, that's, you're, you're missing the boat a little bit there on uh, <laughs> photography, if, if that's your idea. You know, um, it, it's much more immersive. It can just, it's absolutely wonderful, actually. If, yeah, you might know the F-stop, but are you sure about the composition or the time of day you're supposed to be there or the subject you're shooting? You know, there's all kinds of wonderful stuff. So, yeah, I share, I share those sentiments. My, my kid's 14 now, so... Uh, it's not quite as he doesn't tell me every day that he's 14, but I, I suspect when he gets closer to 16, he will, cause he'll be wanting a car, but he might think he's more along the lines of like 21 in maturity with, yes. with being 14. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. So, uh, you're a full-time photographer. You were, I think the last time we were, we were talking, uh, what are the awesome parts of being a full-time photographer? Cause I, me personally, I still have a day job. So I go in to, to work somewhere every day and that place gives me food. You know, I go in there mm. and I make the money to get my food, but you do this for a living. You know, this is your full-time job. So what's cool about that part of it? I think we can, well, let's break it down this way. Um, we can do three three major bullet points on the pros and the cons, right? Okay. And I think there's always this leveling about it. Now, when I say cons, I, I think they're really minor in the big outlook of it uh, because this is for so many people like a dream job and I am extremely grateful to, to be able to do it. Uh, and I work really hard to be able to continue to do it because that's kind of what you have to do when you yeah. do it and rely on it for food, uh, right. which last I checked, you kind of need to live. Yeah, um, just for about but, three weeks or so. Yeah, sure, sure. So let's start with the pros. I, I think for me, the pro of it is that you get to be creative as you want to be with whatever you do. Uh, we have the tools now with technology, social media, the amount of reach that we have and like we're talking on a podcast right now, we could be, you know, across the world in somebody's earbuds who's listening to us right now. And it's just crazy the amount of reach that we have with technology. So <clears throat> that's number one is you get to be creative as you want to be on whatever topic that you want to pick to work on, uh, make a living, earn an income, or just do for fun. Number two is there's limitless growth. Um, and I know like a lot of people say that there's kind of this glass ceiling in photography, you have this amount of potential earnings, but I really think the people who say that are kind of missing the boat on the amount of reach that you actually have. Um, if you think about, you know, how many photos get shared every single day or, uh, how many users there are on Facebook, which is over 2.5 billion now and over 1 billion on Instagram, which Facebook owns Instagram. Now we're talking 3.5 billion people on these platforms that we can share photos on. Uh, it, it's pretty crazy when you think about, okay, let's say a million of those people are really interactive with landscape photography. What if you could reach them with a, just a $5 product? I mean, that would be pretty good return on your investment right there. Right. Yeah. So it, it, there's no real ceiling in how much you can earn. I think the third best here is you also get to just define your life balance. Um, and this has been a, a big learning point for me, especially now that I do have a daughter, a uh, family of, of three total now, um, along with my wife and work-life balance has been something like I used to work like all the time. If I had, if I woke up early in the morning, 
Um, I worked, I worked till like six o'clock at night, just trying to, you know, make things happen, keep the wheels churning. But now I kind of view it as, you know, I'm okay with putting this project off for a few more months because those moments with family are the moments that you'll never get back. So it's kind of this opportunity cost that you're constantly weighing and picking and choosing. Are you going to work today? Are you going to take the afternoon off? And it's this real luxury that you have to be able to pick and choose how you do that. Now let's get to, I think cons is like such a negative word, but for lack of a better term, we'll, we'll get into it. Cons it goes along with that work-life balance. Um, it's really easy when this is what you rely on for income and food and shelter, providing for your family to like be overworked and not take any time off. Um, that's kind of this bad part of the work-life balance that honestly I I do see pretty often, not only in myself, uh, but in a lot of people. Uh, that I follow too is, is you can get wrapped up in it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another part of it where when you only rely on yourself, it can be hard to not beat yourself up when something doesn't go right, rather than viewing it as like, well, this is just something I tried. Now I know that this isn't working, how it's going, how can I fix it? How can I alter it? Um, So there's a lot of that that goes into it. Con number two is kind of stress. uh, And it goes along the same line, just relying on yourself for that source of income and figuring out what works, what doesn't. Um, That's a pretty big uh, con that I've found. And then a third one is um, just having that ability to have that potential reach constantly. uh, Because (laughs) you spend more time like on your phone or on the computer than anything else. And what you loved about photography. Yeah, exactly. You're just (laughs) staring at your screen and what you loved about photography, what you dreamed about getting into it. Now you're not even like picking up your camera anymore. You're just determined on doing this thing. So, um, it's all a balance, I think. And, and when you really figure out that balance and you figure out what you want to do, with your photography business, it gets a lot easier to have that balance, I think. Now, those uh, those are great pros and cons and actually kind of what I thought you would say, which is great to hear. Uh, I know for me, when I, when I did workshops, I planned to start again, but just the amount of doing two workshops a year, for example, the amount of work that you have to put in to that is, is tremendous. And, you know, me having a day job, I was trying to balance the day job with doing that. And it became very stressful. And like you said, if something goes wrong, you feel personally responsible for the fact that it didn't, and it can, uh, it can weigh you down. Uh, but the pros of that is you're doing the things you love to do. And I, I tell my kid all the time, sometimes you have to do the things you don't want to do so that you can do the things you want to do. So we yeah. might not want to be on social media. We might not want to be doing that kind of stuff, but we do want to be out there taking those photos and we want to do it, do it with people too. Uh, I like going out by myself, but I also like having a group of people that uh, share the same thoughts I do. You know? For sure. For sure. And I think like along that same line too, like doing the things that you don't want to do so that you can do what you do want to do. I mean, when it's 3.30 central time around that right now, I've been editing the same video since 8.30 this morning. So there are things that you have to do so that you can go do what you want to do. Yeah, well, I, I tell you what, it might be a little bit of tangent here, but videos, I've tried to do a couple and the amount of time it's like, oh, it only takes 20 minutes to record this video. Yeah, but it takes about three hours to finally get it put out you know and it's only it's a very short video and any any length of time it's amazing you can get yourself lost in that video editing production the whole thing is insane so i can understand yeah and then your your videos are exceptional quality and it looks like you put a lot of thought into them so i can imagine that the editing part of that's pretty big i think most of the time um 
if I have a really good idea about what people want to watch, it makes the video production a lot easier. Um, cause I'm not trying to figure it out or catch attention along the way. I know people are going to search for that particular topic. Um, Perfect. and that allows me to like, not have to put so much effort into the editing. And I used to like, try to keep people's attention with, you know, split cuts and zooming <laughs> in and out and all these fancy transitions. But now I completely ignore that stuff. And I just kind of do a general search on what people are looking for in photography at that point in time. I jot down a few notes, a few, you know, hook titles, and then record an entire video on those bullet points. Usually for like a weekly YouTube video, I can get it done in about two hours uh, oh, max, um, which, which is, you know, streamlining because I used to take a week to get a video done. Uh, and now, you know, it's just one of those things where once you do it enough, it starts to become a little bit easier along the way. Oh, okay. Well, that's good because it's not easy at all right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's hard. It's, it's kind of like, you know, let's say picking up a new topic in photography and trying to figure it out. And, you know, with, let's say like night photography, how <laughs> long does that time. <laughs> take? Yeah. It's, it's just really hard to do. It's just streamlining the process and figuring out all the little shortcuts along the way. So, you know, we've talked about the fact that you do this for food, uh, uh -huh. stress of everything that you do, you know, the cons that we talked about when all of that starts piling up, have you ever, has it ever affected your creativity? Does, trying to find YouTube videos that people want to watch and then having to do your own video version of it, maybe not something you necessarily wanted to cover. Does that hurt your creativity or your inspiration? I, I think it, it kind of wavers back and forth. Um, I don't think it hurts creativity as a whole, but it just kind of transitions it from one thing to another. Um, and I, I think it comes with a lot of learning when you're doing it full time, because I used to only think about like doing photography and that was my creative outlet. Well, now I kind of think of it as, um, you know, what words am I going to use in a video or what words am I going to use in a caption for a photo or how can I, you know, write an email that gives my email list a massive amount of value in a, a, just a simple email that they get every single week. So I think it transitions from one thing to another. And that didn't really click for me until I did start studying the business side of like running your own small business really, really carefully. Um, because what I found was it talked a lot about, you know, creating graphics or, using images or creating videos or how to talk to people so that it's not just, you know, all about me, me, me. Mm -hmm. um, it is my business and I am producing this content. But when I really started to discover that I kind of, I, I'm not ever going to be like top, you know, 50 photographers on the planet. I know that 100%. I, I think there are a lot of people out there who are better than me who aren't even doing it for a living. So when I kind of realized that and checked my ego, I kind of rebranded myself um, in my mind as, okay, I'm not really a photographer per se, but I'm more like a media company that talks about photography and helps people with their photography. So when I thought about it that way, it freed up a lot of this pressure to like be the best or take the best photo or, you know, top the list on this technique and photography. Okay. And I was just like, I'm this much further down the road than somebody else. What can I do to help them get up to where I am? Yeah, um, and when you, it's great. yeah, when you look at it that way, you know, podcasts, uh, videos on YouTube, workshops, things like that, then it, it kind of frees you up from thinking I've always got to produce the best photo possible in any given situation. Now that's a, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. Actually, the way I look at this podcast 
is that I don't make a dime off this podcast. So right. for me, I do it because I love to talk about photography. I love to meet new people. You know, I got to meet you. This is my second time. That's my dog behind me, by the way. What's up, dog? <laughs> but uh, I, I get to meet great, interesting people. I don't make a dime from this, and uh, that's that's okay. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's where I'm at, you know, maybe YouTube eventually, but I don't make those videos thinking that I'm going to get wealthy from them either. So for me, it's just right now, it's about staying creative, uh, staying in photography, no matter what, whether I make any, any money at it or not. So it, yeah, it, yeah. it helps and me stay inspired when I realize that I'm going to go and I'm going to take photos. I'm going to make videos that I want to make, uh, regardless. So for sure. For sure. And I think pod, you know, this podcasting is fun just because yeah. you get to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And now when we comment back and forth on social media, we know who each other are. And I think yep. it adds that extra layer of depth to, to any, you know, relationship, friendship, things like that. No, definitely. Uh, this whole, the whole podcast thing, I've got to meet so many great people. I've got to, to meet you, uh, Moose Peterson, and Nick Page, you know, there's mm -hmm. just so many people uh, that that are escaping me right now. Steve Mathis, uh, there's a whole mm -hmm. lot of folks that I got to meet that I wouldn't get to meet and talk to about this wonderful thing that we do uh, if I hadn't been for the podcast. And it keeps me going. So I don't make any money on podcasting, but I love to talk about it. I'd love to make money on podcasting, but if it never happens, I'm still going to make these. <laughs> I think I, I would love to get your input on this too, because I've had so many people say like podcasting is saturated and it, there's no return on it because you don't really make money with it. I, I kind of think, and I'd love to get your feedback uh, as well, since you do it too. I think it opens more doors than other things because it is still such a niche thing in landscape photography. You know, they're probably, you know, I, I could probably name under 10 podcasts right now that I'm aware of in landscape photography. So there's really not that many people doing it. Yeah. And there's a whole lot that go through the pod fade where they just disappear yeah. forever. And right. th that's what something I didn't want to do. I almost did uh, as a result of COVID and all of that, but I, I started coming back to it. Um, so I don't want to be the pod fade. I want to be around for years doing this. And you're right. There's just, there's not that many. So th it might be saturated in other markets, but I don't think it's saturated in this one. And besides, if you do a podcast and I do a podcast, that means we get to talk to each other about podcasts. It's great. Yeah. And they're totally different. So <laughs> yeah, you know, they are. Yeah. Yep. All right. So when, when everything does get you down, cause I know I call it, it's sort of like a pendulum or a sine wave, you know, that goes like this where your inspiration is up and then your inspiration is down. Or as, as sometimes it happens, you go out with all these big expectations of the kind of photograph that you want to make and the weather doesn't cooperate. And then you go home feeling like a failure. So when you get into those low moments, what do you do to stay inspired? Or do you um, have low moments? I've, I've encountered a few people that never get to the bottom, it seems. No, I definitely have low moments. Um, I think for me, it's a lot. I, I definitely have those. Like if I go out, I, I can think back to last year when I went to Zion and I like got no photos, which is oh, wow. really hard to do in Zion yeah. because it's such a beautiful place. <laughs> And I was just like, extremely confused, like couldn't really get anything and getting really frustrated. Cause the last time I went out there, I was like, wow, you know, got like hundreds of photos. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't really understand what was happening. And I kind of came away with it, you know, took probably a couple days off when I got back, uh, which is something that, that I would recommend to anybody do because you're, you're on such a high after a trip, it's good to take a couple days off to just decompress and get back to even keel, you know? <laughs> um, and I kind of thought I still have a lot of really bad photos that I can actually make somewhat decent. So it's really not a fail in the sense where I now have nothing to do. I have a pretty good amount of work to do on ways that I could make 
take bad photos and show people how to make them better. Um, so since I was viewing myself then as kind of like a media company, I was like, well, now I kind of have a lot of work to do because I have a <laughs> lot of these images on my hands that are not good. Um, and I can figure out how to make them better, uh, and show other people how to do that. Now, personally, like I am a very competitive person, so I want to like take the best photos that I possibly can. So if I view it just as the photographer side of me, that is extremely frustrating when I can't figure it out or, you know, compose something in a beautiful location like that, that I'm only at for a few days. So that is really frustrating. Uh, but I think, I think it's healthy to also look at it like, you know what, that's okay. Um, I may be back here or I may not. These locations aren't really going anywhere <laughs> in the grand are, scheme of gonna things. Have trouble. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, um, I kind of think of it that way. Um, because I, I also get really frustrated and down when I can't go take photos because of other projects that I have going on or, um, yeah, you know, work obligations. And I'm like, Oh, I feel kind of trapped here, but it's just really good to remember those places aren't going anywhere. Just do what you need to do right now. And sometime in the future, you'll probably get to go there. Um, and you'll probably be a little bit more refined when you're able to. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great way to look at it. I know that I get down sometimes in those situations where you're out there in those beautiful locations, the lights doing everything you want, and then you can't get a composition. <laughs> yeah. That's the yeah. worst because you see the light starting to fade and you just can't do it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I was even even last uh a couple of years ago in death valley i just like quit on the day and then it was the most insane sunset oh. ever and i was just like wow yeah you could was... see it in the rearview mirror on your way yeah. back yeah i was like rookie mistake you know <laughs> are, are you familiar with rick salmon have you heard of him yeah he uh i asked him one time what he does because he's been doing this for i don't know it seems like 150 years, uh, the, the way he talks about it. And I asked him what he does when he gets, uh, gets in those low moments. And he said, just keep shooting. He, he said, yeah. you might not be producing what you want. You might not be even having that much fun doing it, but he said, just keep shooting. And I thought he was just, uh, full of it at the time. And, uh, I, but I decided why not, what's it going to hurt? Pixels are free. Right. So I yeah. kept shooting and kept shooting and sure enough, he was, he was right. It's just a matter of forcing yourself to do it sometimes when you're not feeling inspired because it's not a switch. You can't just say, Oh, today I'm going to be inspired. You either yeah. are, or you aren't. So you just got to work through it when you're not. How long did it take you? Uh, I think in that situation, probably six months. Okay. Maybe being pretty, uh, bummed about it, you know, yeah. I, I'm like you as well. I'm competitive with myself. So when I go out and I don't get the images, I think I should where I'm at in my photography, then I get bummed. And I get down and I get uninspired and I say, well, nobody's looking at the photos anyway. Why do I even bother? Yeah, the, I go through all of that. And then uh, right. pick up the camera and you go out and you have a day where everything clicks and everything's glorious and it's beautiful and your inspiration hits. And yeah, that's just why I do it. So. Yeah. And that's a really good way to look at it. And I, I, the reason I ask you is a lot of people, if they haven't gone through that yet, which they probably will in the future, is they think it's going to be like a couple days, couple weeks. And then when it starts hitting months, you're like, what is happening yeah. right now? And you're really confused. So I, it's good that like, I've had similar experiences. So it's good to like put an expectation on it or kind of the wide view of it. So people aren't like, it's been two days. Why am I not inspired <laughs> right now? <laughs> And I would actually caution everybody to not do what I did. So one thing I learned is, you know, COVID came along, it killed my business. And yeah. then I just got all kinds of depressed about, I'd put all this effort in. I was doing well. I was running workshops and bringing some money in, doing all that. It was having a blast. And then COVID killed it all. And I, uh -huh. one day I just, I had enough and I, I had the nature photography show website and I had the Facebook pages. And then I had a YouTube channel that had maybe 60 videos and I shut it all down. 
I said, that's yeah. it. It's done. And so when you're going through those low moments of inspiration, don't make any rash decisions. That's, <laughs> that's going to be one bit of advice that I give you. Yeah. No knee jerk reactions in those times. <laughs> right. Yeah. I only know that because, well, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when I was reading through some of your posts on online. I came across one. I'm like, man, that sounds really, really depressing. And uh, you mentioned that one of your driving forces is when someone told you you're going to die. Uh -huh. So how, uh, how do you, how does that affect you without making you horribly depressed thinking about it? Well, it's just a fact of life. Like we're yeah. all, going to reach that point um, <laughs> it's, happen. it's you cannot avoid that so I think when you fully accept that as kind of like your end and the actual reality that is going to come someday um it just makes me work even harder to make it a reality um and that's not like saying, well, I'm just going to hustle 24 uh, seven. I'm not going to do anything else besides like take photography or do my business. It's more along the lines of like, what, what am I going to regret? Um, because I have had, and I'm not trying to be like super depressing here. I've had uh, both of my mom's parents so my my mom's side grandparents die in the last year um and talking to them they don't they probably don't have many regrets but things like um looking into like my grandfather's eyes when he was talking about how he went to all six continents but he never got to antarctica that was like it was painful to mm -hmm. see knowing that he could not do it. Um, so for me, when I realize that that's the actual end, I'm like, okay, what do I actually want my life to look like? Um, and how do I want to approach that? Number one, you could look at it on the photography side and say, I'm going to do everything that I can to do this for a full-time career. And within reason, obviously, right. you're not going to like divorce your wife, leave yeah, your family. The family. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a little extreme. Um, but you're going to do everything within the realm of possibility and logic, and you're going to try to make that happen. And if you do that, you're never going to like regret that you tried. You're always right. going to regret that you didn't try. Um, so I always say like, go for it. If you want to start a podcast, just try it. If you want to do yeah. videos, just try it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can just try. And if you don't like it, just be like, you know what? That, yeah, I didn't like it. I'm not going to do it. Um, on the flip side, you know, we've been talking about balance and family and stuff. Like the reason I wanted to do photography full time, one of the big ones is I wanted to be home a lot with my family. Oh. So I'm not going to, you know, go on, all, lead all these workshops or things like that and have to do my photography career doing workshops when I want to be at home as much right. as possible. Um, so I'm, I am never going to regret spending more time with my family. And I know that right. maybe some people would, uh, but that's just <laughs> them. Right. Uh, but that's just one of the choices that I've made and how I want to live my life. And that's kind of, what that quote actually means like if if you looked at somebody who could like tell the future and they were like hey you're gonna die in 2026 what would you do between now and then to kind of live it up and and follow your dreams that's you, you, we never know when the end is actually coming so right. you might as well Everybody. start immediately right yeah no that's that's uh brilliant actually and uh some of what you said actually takes me back to my mom. She passed away in 2013 and my whole life, she always said she, now you gotta understand East Tennessee, born and raised, uh -huh. she married a sailor. So she moved around a little bit, but if it were really up to her, she would have just stayed in Tennessee forever. And that would have been it. Yeah. 
but yeah. her whole life and me growing up, she always talked about wanting to see the redwood forests out right. in California and she never got to see them, you know, and, yeah. and cause she, you know, we didn't know that it was going to happen the way it happened and how fast it happened. And yeah. uh, certainly she didn't. So absolutely what you got to say there is very important because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. So, you know, you got to yeah. start living it today. And if there's something you really want to do, then go for it. Absolutely. And I think it, I think it also comes down to like being confident in your choice. Um, I can remember uh, when my daughter was really, really young, like newborn stage, sleep deprived, just <laughs> getting absolutely crushed in every direction. <laughs> and I was visiting uh, my grandparents and my grandma was like, cause I was staying home so much. Like uh, my wife was working three days a week. I was working the other two days that she was home. So I was with my daughter three days out of the five workday week. Uh, and then on weekends too. And I was like going insane because I wasn't sleeping. I was around crying nonstop. And uh, my grandma was like, you know, not a lot of dads at all get to experience it the way you're experiencing it. And that really put things into perspective for me and be really confident in the choice that I made to be around that much and help her get ready for, you know, school when she has school and really like not get upset when I have to do her hair, because now that's one of our strongest bonding experiences in the mornings is, you know, I get to do her hair and all that stuff. And it's just really cool and, and being confident in allowing myself to to realize that that's the choice I made. And that's really what I want to do when I look back on it, you know, 20 years down the road, if I'm fortunate enough to have that. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And you take something that sounds depressing and you, you turn it into something positive, you know, it's kind yeah, of any... live in the now <laughs> because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Anytime I say like, you're going to die. I think I said it like around my mom one time and she was like, Oh my goodness. And I was like, well, I mean, it's just like a fact. Yeah, we all are. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. I always say that I plan to live forever and so far so good. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. All right. So you, as we've talked about a couple of times, run a podcast. Mm -hmm. What is that podcast yeah. and what, what made so, you decide to do it? I do a, a podcast called the landscape photography show. I've always really enjoyed podcasting. Uh, I started one back in 2010 actually. Um, so a long time ago, that one was called photography round table. Um, and I, you know, it was interview based. Um, but I stopped doing it around 2016, uh, because I was just like really tired of the same questions or asking like different <laughs> people, the same questions yes. over and over yeah. and hearing the same answers. And I was like, you know, there's gotta be, I, I know there's more to photography than this. Like we gotta, <laughs> we gotta change things up here. So I took a, a long time off of it actually. Um, and I started, uh, a second podcast in 2018, um, that lasted, about three episodes and <laughs> I was quickly like, no, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't what, what I want to do. Um, so I came up with a third one called the landscape photography show and I wanted it to be way more about like the other person, uh, what makes them tick their family life, other things they do oh, besides nice. photography. And then we kind of weave that weave photography in along the way. So, um, it makes every single episode very, very different. And since everybody has a different lifestyle and life journey, it never really gets old. Um, and I, I love that part of it. Um, I am going to make some changes to it though. Uh, because when you, I think I'm at 155 episodes now. Um, and when you, yeah. When you interview 155 photographers, you're like, I'm starting to reach the bottom of the barrel here. I, I don't know <laughs> who else to reach out to. Um, so what I'm planning to do is bring someone else on and kind of do episodes where we talk about, you know, uh, 
topics, different things like that, what's going on in the photography world. Um, and we'll, you know, banter back and forth, things like that. And we'll still interview people along the way. Uh, yeah. but I want to like spice up the show a little bit and have a little bit of change, uh, so it can last another, you know, 150 episodes. So I, I think I like podcasting just similarly to what you said earlier, you get to be in front of someone else, you get to interact with them, you get to learn about them and what they do, um, and make those connections because it kind of alludes to what I said, you know, podcasting opens so many doors that, you aren't aware of at the time, but years later down the road, it kind of, they reveal themselves uh, because so many people listen that you're not aware of, right? So um, it's helped me, you know, teach at conferences. Um, it's helped me meet other photographers that turned into good friendships, other business ventures, ideas. Um, and it's always fun to like talk to other photographers about what they have going on. And, um, I've had a, a few good friends in photography reach out to me and, you know, propose business ideas and, you know, things that they were thinking about and we worked on them together and tweaked them back and forth. And it's just, it's one of those things that you don't realize how much value it has at the time and until later. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's excellent. The, just the, the fact that 155 interviews, that's, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty crazy. But I like the fact that you change up when you feel like it's either not necessarily getting stale, but when you're reaching the bottom of the bucket there and you don't have anybody else that you know to call or have on the show or have on again, then the fact that you're looking to change it up, that's, that's good. You've got to be agile in the business of photography because it is you know it is a business even though you're having fun podcasting uh this for you is your livelihood so you've got to keep it fresh to some degree yeah i mean i i look at myself as like a youtube consumption machine because i watch so much i don't i like don't even turn on tv i just go I to youtube and start watching um and i remember one vlog i was watching from casey neistat and he was talking about like just being tired of how things were going. And I, you know, he vlogged every single day for years. Oh my goodness. Um, and then he was like, you know what? I'm just going to like not do it for a few months. <laughs> and I was like, at first I was like, what? Like, this is yeah. almost like a show that I watch religiously. Every day. And then he just stopped and... <laughs> I remember when he came back on and he, he moved from New York to California and he did a vlog just randomly from California and was talking about like all the changes and everything and knee jerk reaction. I was like, no, I want you to do what I'm used to you doing. <laughs> um, but then I realized like, you're doing it wrong. I, re I realized like he's the one producing it. So, okay. you know, it's his life. He gets to live it. So I looked at it, you know, my own show being like, you know what? I've got to, I've got to like switch things up here to kind of like what you were saying, stay inspired, staying yeah. on top of it and diff putting different ideas out there. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. I I'm glad, you know, I'd like to say that I listened to your show a lot, but it was only until I, I guess maybe a few months ago, I, I started listening to the podcast again, because I go through times where I don't. And I, right. I picked up on that. And I've been listening to it ever since. So it's, it's always good to hear. Uh, it's good to hear the interviews that you have. And of course, your audio sounds amazing. So all of that's all of that's great. Well, I mean, when you buy, when you buy a good mic, you need <laughs> one to let I have I've had this mic since when was that 2014, the exact same mic. Um, so you always want to buy like good stuff. Yeah. Even though it hurts when you yeah. buy it. Buy nice or buy twice. <laughs> That's um, right. That's it's right. sort of the, the tripod tax that we always talk about where you, the first tripod is the $25 one from Walmart, yeah. you know, that has yeah. a little crank to raise the yeah. center post. And then you buy another one, it's maybe 50. And then you buy another one, it's a hundred. And then you're like, okay, fine. Yeah. And then you get one of the good, really, really nice ones. And you're like, why didn't I do this 10 years ago? So exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. So do you do workshops? I, I didn't know if you did them or I know you do conferences. 
I, I do conferences. Um, I do not do my own workshops. Okay. Uh, and I'll lay out why, because a lot of people want to know why I do not. Um, and I get emails about it. Like, are you doing any workshops this year? No, I am not. Um, so I like to do conferences because number one, when you start a landscape photography business and you want to do workshops, you have to have like a lot of liability insurance. Um, you Absolutely. might want to do an LLC, uh, which is a limited liability corporation. And uh, you might want to insure your gear. So all these costs start to add up. Um, and then not to mention the cost of getting permits in different national parks, first okay. aid permits, all this stuff kind of goes into it that you don't really think about on the front end. <laughs> when, when I started to realize that, um, like you talked about at the very beginning, you know, it takes a long time to organize a workshop. Absolutely. I did not like a lot of that work. Um, which I really liked being out in the field and teaching other people, but the workload leading, leading up to it was really taxing on me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I chose to do conferences because all of the liability is on the conference. They're the ones with the insurance. They're the ones booking the hotels. They're the ones planning everything out. <laughs> I literally just have to show up and do what they tell me to do. <laughs> and I still get to interact with other photographers and teach them oh, how to great. do stuff. So it, it eliminates everything that I don't like to do. And it kind of amplifies the things that I do like to do. Um, and I'm extremely grateful that I've been able to work with conferences like out of Chicago, uh, outsiders conference, just to name a couple, uh, and also online conferences teaching that way. But I, that's why I chose to do conferences instead of workshops. And I think I think that there's a market for both. Um, I remember when I was on Matt Payne's podcast, uh, F stop collaborate and listen, <laughs> it was, uh, had to have been 2018, somewhere around there. And I remember I said, I believe that workshops as we know it kind of as that framework are going to die. Um, wow. and it kind of shocked him. But I was like, let me explain, um, because I still think there is a niche for workshops, how they are as kind of like, think about it like big store, small store. You know, we always talk about shopping local, things like that. Big store like Walmart is going to be like your conference workshops um, where they have a lot of marketing capability. They have a huge email list that they're able to reach out to. That is kind of like your supersized Walmart of uh workshops um not saying everything is walmart quality where it's going to break two days after you buy it but <laughs> little like local workshops are kind of like the boutique stores that you can go to to buy really good like really high value products for maybe even a higher price um so i think there's room for both if you have, like, I was talking with, about this with my friend, uh, Dusty the other day saying, you know, I still think there's a huge market for location specific workshops that one person knows really, really intimately, and you are guaranteed to get the best shots, no matter what the weather is, time of year, anything like that. Um, but I also see a lot changing in the fact of some of the biggest photographers are kind of going the route of the larger sized workshops and conferences. Um, not that it's a bad thing and, and I do conferences too. So, you know, I totally understand why they're doing it. Uh, but again, I think there's enough room in the market for both kinds of workshops, if that makes yeah, sense. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Actually. I, I love conferences because you get to meet a whole lot more people than mm -hmm. you would at a workshop. Uh, and the fact that everything's taken care of and it's all usually in one location, maybe have some outings that you do among the conference. I think there's definitely a place for it. And I would love to attend those myself uh, as a participant or, or otherwise the workshops, uh, as you mentioned, as we've talked about the amount of work that goes into it between the, the fees 
the having to deal with the national parks. If you've never mm -hmm. dealt with the national park service, it depends on who you get as to whether or not you're going to pull your hair out. Yeah. If, uh, the grand Tetons, for example, is an absolute nightmare to deal with the park service, you know, and you're trying to bring in business for them. And the people right. that you usually bring in are, are good, decent people that aren't going to damage anything. That's yeah. usually who attends the workshops but they make it very difficult. The Smoky Mountains, on the other hand, takes a week tops and you'll have your permit in your hand, you know, whereas mm -hmm. the Grand Tetons is months and months and months of going back and forth, getting them what they need, commercial car insurance, your general liability insurance, all these different policies you've got to produce. It's absolutely insane. So I can understand, especially from a photographer's perspective, wanting that burden to be put on someone else as in the conference has people that do that for a living. Yeah. And so they get to do all of that kind of stuff. And then you get to come in and, and either participate or, or otherwise in the conference. You would think the national park system would have a, like the same process for every single park. Yeah. The national park service. <laughs> Logically you would think that, right. but yeah, that is not, not the case. <laughs> that's not how it works. In fact, if you look at the grand Tetons, what they require with commercial vehicle insurance, and then uh, like, you can't drive your vehicle, even if you don't carry anyone, you, yeah. you still can't, you have to have that commercial, but you go over to death Valley. They don't require it. You, you talk to, Great Smoky Mountains, and you say, well, I'm not taking anybody with me. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. So yeah. the, it's just, you're right. If they were all uniform and together, it would be a lot easier. That way you could kind of do it. Once you knew how to do it, you could replicate that pretty easy, but it's different every exactly. time. And it depends exactly. on who you get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I understand that. That's, that's good. I would love to see, uh, I'd love to be on a workshop with you. Uh, but I understand completely why the conference is the way to go so. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> and like conferences are like drinking from a fire hose, right? You have so much information. <laughs> there are so many people there, uh, so many conversations going on at once. They have like sponsored companies that come in and show you cameras and all this other stuff. When you're on like a, a small group workshops with local people who know the place really, really well. It's like having, having just enough of the right information to get you the best photos. Um, and it's, it's a slower pace, but it's often like much more digestible than putting your mouth up to a fire hose and being like, go, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, for me running workshops, getting to that point is a nightmare, but once you're there yeah. and you're doing the, the workshops, it's, oh. it's such a hoot for me. For sure. For you sure. Know, the, Cause I, I like to go to each individual person or even sometimes I'll set my gear up and I'll say, Hey, this is what I'm looking at. And then the mm -hmm. things that you learn from the people that are, are learning from you, is, it's wonderful. And you, I've met lifelong friends at this point, all because yeah. of photography and workshops and doing all that stuff. So it's worth the pain and suffering up front most of the time anyway, but, uh, I, I would like that the pain and suffering at the beginning to be a little easier. But I, I think if we continue to have lawyers, it's just always going to hurt <laughs> for sure. Not only time-wise, but financially. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's uh 250 here and then, you know, 250 there. And then, uh, before you know it, you're spending a ton of money. Oh, the worst one a few years back was uh, death Valley. I called the resort to try to book the rooms because I decided I yeah. want to do a workshop in Death Valley. And it was going to cost me $14,000 with no return policy whatsoever. As yeah. in, if you didn't use it, if you canceled the next day, then you still had to pay the $14,000. So right. yeah, the, there's a lot of businesses that make it tough, really make it tough on you. Yeah. But, well, I mean, Death Valley, if you even get a hot dog there, it's like $30. It's, no lie. It is. It is. It's so, it's so crazy. We, we went into the little store. Uh, we were out there just for three days. My kid had a hockey tournament out in Vegas and we said, Hey, we got three days. Let's, we got a few extra days. Let's go to Death Valley. And so I took all my camera gear and we went out there and it was, um, it was a great, a great experience. It rained more probably while I was there than it does in a year in that place, which <laughs> was funny, but we, we decided, Hey, let's go into the little general store. And Oh my goodness, 
It's like $15 yeah. for a little thing of peanut butter. Yeah. It yeah. was unbelievable. But well, they know, I mean, the closest thing besides that's like three hours away. Yeah, so exactly. You're exactly. kind of trapped. <laughs> they are. And, and the rooms weren't even that great. You know, they're just no, they're not. kind of common low end yep. hotel rooms for $350 a night or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Sanity that's right. it was. That's right. All right. So future plans, what do you got coming? What do you, what are you doing? So future plans are, you know, I've, I've, alluded to kind of looking at myself as a media company. Um, so future plans right now, uh, I've started a new website, uh, and, and kind of a media platform called landscape photography university. Uh, okay. it's just landscape photography university.com. And it is going to host courses on there that people can purchase. Um, I've already got a composition course on there now uh, that basically takes you from knowing nothing about composition to being a composition expert in eight hours. So it's a really fast walkthrough of learning everything about composition that you possibly can. Um, and that is available now. I'm about, I mentioned, you know, working on one video since 8.30 this, yeah. this morning. Um, I'm very close to finishing the uh, business course that I have on how to start uh, your landscape photography business. And it's called 30 day photography business. So it shows you how to start and finish planning out a business, mapping it out. And it's designed to be able to help you go from start to finish and earning a five to six figure landscape photography business. So all the tools that I've looked at, all the tools that I know planning, market research, uh, all the way down to like Facebook ads, how to run them really well, uh, is all in that course. So that was a large, large undertaking. Um, but <laughs> it will be available on pre pre-release very soon, um, to where people can sign up early for like helping it get launched and, and stuff like that. So well, I, um, I may have to to make that purchase right there, because I have to tell you <laughs> social media, I am horrendous at social media and, and getting people, you know, getting the likes and getting all that stuff. I'm terrible at it. So, well, I think like, <laughs> especially now, uh, what's really interesting with social media specifically. Um, and I, YouTube did it this, uh, one or two weeks ago where they changed up how they, um, suggest videos to people where, they would basically put the people who are most popular with the most subscribers up at the top of the list of suggested, but now they're switching it up to where subscribers like don't even matter anymore. And it's all about your audience retention and how many views that video has. Um, so they're basically all about how do we keep people on YouTube as long as possible? Um, so they're changing things up like that. And on the flip side, um, I think, and we talked about workshops and having those kind of like smaller localized workshops. I think that's one of the biggest missed opportunities for smaller workshop providers is running targeted specific ads to locations or to their specific email list on workshops. Um, and I say that because it is the smallest amount of money you can spend for advertising and you usually get direct results from that, but running them is confusing and it's a little hard. Uh, but I have literally spent about six months studying Facebook ads and how that works. And I'm very excited to, to share that in the course. Well, uh, consider yourself having already made one sale. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely awesome. be picking that up. That's great. Well, <laughs> David, thank you so much for coming back on after all this time and, and catching us up on where you are. And I think we've had some really, really good discussions today. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Anytime, man. Uh, happy to come on. You know, I always love catching up uh, off recording too. So always reach out. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, everybody, that's going to be it for this episode. And as always, grab your camera, get off the couch, escape, explore, and create.